Hello everyone, today we're going to go and check out some virtual networking that's related to Azure Virtual Machines and we're going to look at a few things, we're going to check out some network security groups, we're going to look at the VNIX, we're going to go check out public and private IP addresses in relation to the virtual machine connectivity and we're also then going to look at some best practices and maybe some speed improvements that we can do on our virtual networks that are used by our virtual machines. So let's get straight into it and talk about virtual networking on Azure with Azure Virtual Machines. So I'm back over here in the Azure portal and I have my VM demo machine actually loaded. So if I jump into VM demo over here, we'll see a couple of bits and bobs going on. So we'll see that this actually has a public IP address assigned to it and it actually has a private IP address assigned to it. This VM demo machine is actually plugged into this VM demo VNet and inside this VM demo VNet, you'll find it has an address space of 10.1.0.0 slash 16. And if I go into subnets, it actually has a subnet called default with a subset of that range of 10.1.0.0 slash 24. This is what got created by default when this virtual machine got deployed. So if we go back to the VM demo resource group, we'll also be able to see this VNIC, this network interface. This is connected into that virtual machine demo and it was also connected directly to that uh, virtual network and to the subnet in that virtual network. I can see the IP address configurations from here and it actually has two IP addresses plugged into it, both a private IP address and a public IP address. And that's the public IP address I'm actually going to use to connect to the VM right now. So let's go back to the VM demo over here and I can actually use that public IP address here 20.84.121.79 to go and connect to that VM. And here we are RDP'd into the machine that's running inside Azure. So it's going to bounce up server manager. I don't really want that. We can get rid of that. Let's just go and have a look at some of the networking inside this machine. And inside command prompt, I'm going to run a command that you're probably used to, ipconfig forward slash all. Let's just go check out and see what this networking sort of looks like. So first of all, it's got an IP address here of 10.1.0.4, that's fine. It is actually a DHCP assigned address. Now here's the confusing thing, there's no DHCP server involved in this process. It's all done with software defined networking. So where does that IP address come from? Well, that IP address has actually come from the subnet itself that this is attached to. So the subnet has that range of IP addresses and that's going to inject this IP address inside here. You'll notice there's also some other slightly weird addresses here. So there's the DHCP server and the DNS server. This is both 168.63.129.16. This is actually an internal management IP address of Azure. Do not block this. If you do, you're going to have a bad time. So I'm hearing you thinking already, this is actually running Windows. Windows Server. For example, if I do WinVer, you'll see this is running Windows Server 2022. So our servers normally have static IP addresses, don't they? So should I set a static IP address? Can I set a static IP address? You can. Now, if I pop over here into Network and Sharing Center, a very familiar location to many people, and I look at my network card down here, uh, and I go into the properties of this, and I click on TCP IPv4, and I click on properties, and I set a static IP address here, you will break everything. So don't do that. The way you actually set a static IP address is this. So let's go in here and click on Network Settings. And inside Network Settings, we can see we can find the network card itself. Let's go find that network card and inside the network card that's attached to this virtual machine, I click on the IP configuration. So here inside the IP configuration, this is where you can set a static IP address if you want to. Now it's not kind of technically a static IP address, but what this is going to do is it's more like a DHCP reservation. It will actually inject that static, that same, sorry, it will inject that same IP address every single time into this machine. So the next thing to talk about in regards to virtual machines is going to be network security groups. Now these network security groups here, like I have one here called VM Demo NSG, these are linked to either your VNIC or linked to a subnet. And they act a little bit like a firewall because all they really do is block inbound and outbound traffic here. They don't understand anything about the traffic. They're operating on layers three and four of the OSI model. And you can see that mine here has port 3389 currently allowed through. That means that that will actually be able to get through to that virtual machine. But if I try to access, for example, a web server running inside that virtual machine, this is not going to work because the network security group is going to block that traffic. 
If I want to add something to this network security group, it's very easy to do. I can just pop here into inbound security rules, click on add, and I've got a couple of settings here. There's nothing particularly special. The source is any, so this is going to be the traffic coming from anywhere over the internet, but I could specify individual IPs if I wanted to lock down that traffic. Um, and I'm going to say any and source port ranges from any port from any location going to any destination at the moment is going to use a specific service. So I'm going to select the service of HTTP. Notice that just adds port 80 in here. These services down here are just linking to specific port numbers. So if you know your port numbers, you don't really technically need to use this here. So I'm going to put HTTP for action of allow and there's even a priority setting down here. So when you're doing priorities, guys, remember jump in things like 100. So jump from 100 to 200 to 300 if you're setting priorities so that you've actually got space within that numbering system to be able to insert more records or insert more rules if you need. So we'll just leave this as 310 for the moment and allow any HTTP inbound. That's good. Now also what I'm going to do is I'm going to add another one in here so I can actually add a custom service down here and I'm not going to do it on port 8080. Let's change that to HTTPS and we're going to allow that through as well. Now that means that we can actually go and access both port 80 and port 443 over the public IP address and going to this specific virtual machine. So let's go test that. So to test that, I'm over here in the virtual machine. I'm just going to install IIS very quickly. So I'm in add roles and features. Let's just do a next, next, next. And let's go for installing a web server for ISS here. And we're going to use that default website that comes with it to test if we actually have communication over port 80 or over port 443 to this computer. So IIS is now actually installed on this machine. Let's just check that I can actually access this locally. So we're going to do 127.0.0.1. And we'll just do a loopback address here. And we can see IIS is running. Now let's see if we can access that externally as well. So if I pop back to my VM demo and I go and take that public IP address again, let's just paste that public IP address directly into the web browser here and we've got the same IIS. So we can see that traffic is now being allowed through the network security group. So if you find that you actually install software into your virtual machines and you're attempting to access them directly over the internet, directly over the public IP address, probably not the best way of doing things, but for testing is perfectly fine. So another thing we want to kind of have a look at from a network security network speed standpoint is how fast does this thing actually go. So if I take a look at my network settings here for the network card inside the virtual machine, you'll notice that this is actually running at 50 gigabits per second. So they're very, very, very fast network cards and in very, very, very fast networking inside Azure. But does it actually run at 50 gigabits per second? Well, kind of. So if I come over to speedtest.net here and we attempt to run just a very basic speed test, Wow, that's a lot of adverts. No, I don't need you to know my location. We can see this is running pretty darn quickly inside this machine. But the speed that this has actually got connected to the internet and the speed that it's actually interconnecting with other things inside Azure is very dependent on the CPU and the actual RAM of this machine. There isn't actually an option to say, okay, this is running at 10 gigabits or 20 gigabits or 50 gigabits. It's going to go as fast as possible dependent on the spec of the VM. So the limiting factor here is the processing power of the VM, not necessarily the NIC itself. So we're not getting 50, uh, 50 megabits per second, sorry, 50 gigabits per second, but we are still getting a pretty darn decent speed to the internet here. Now, if I draw out a little diagram here, we could kind of optimize that speed itself. So say, for example, you do have a VNet with the appropriate subnets inside there and we do have a couple of virtual machines actually attached to that vnet so a vm1 and maybe a vm2 down there as well now the communication between those two virtual machines is going to be really really quick but you can get it to be a little bit quicker as well because when you deploy these virtual machines where are they going well they're going into racks of computers inside an azure data center and microsoft are going to attempt to put those virtual machines on the most efficient placement of racks and of actual physical servers in their data center. Now what we can do is we can actually tell Microsoft that these two virtual machines are going to do a lot of communication between each other and therefore to put them as close as possible in the data center. So what we can do is we can wrap these up together and that feature is something called a proximity 
placement group. So let's go and have a look very quickly on how to create a proximity placement group in Azure. It's not too hard. So we're back over here in the Azure portal and I'm just going to search for proximity placement groups. Select that. We'll create a proximity placement group inside here. We can create this on our specific subscription. We can pop this into this VM demo location and we'll call this proximity placement group um, prox group one. We'll be very inventive for this. It'll be in the region of East US, that's fine. And the attended details, the type of virtual machines that are going to exist inside here, they're going to be DS4 V3s. We're not going to have a specific zone preference for them. They could be deployed to any zone. So we're over here inside our prox group one. There's nothing for us to actually really do down here apart from change the sizes of sizes of the virtual machines that could potentially exist in here. So how do we use this? Well, when we create future virtual machines in here and we go to this process of creating an Azure virtual machine, there will be an option inside this wizard to select a proximity placement group. It's not here on the basic level, but if I go across to advanced down here, I can come down to the bottom and you can see we've got proximity placement groups and I could select my prox group one. So if I was creating multiple virtual machines that I wanted to intercommunicate with each other as fast as possible, I would make sure they are in the appropriate proximity group one. This will not change any other networking in regards to this. This will not change the IP addresses. It just tells Azure to kind of group these together, okay? You don't really want to do that for multiple machines that require high availability. Say, for example, if you are running two domain controllers, you don't want those two domain controllers to exist on the same physical box at the same time because then you've got a single point of failure. So you have to kind of balance this with high availability and whatever applications are actually running on those machines. But if you need absolutely the best connectivity, this is how you do it. So just a couple of best practices now. So if you do have multiple VNets in your environment, so a VNet1, and you might have a VNet2 inside your environment, don't do overlapping address spaces. So if you do, for example, on this VNet 10.10.0.0 slash 16 as the entire range, and this guy is going to be 10. 10.0.0 slash 16 as well. Now, these two VNets will be able to work independently of each other, but because they have an overlapping address space, but because they have an overlapping address space, you will never actually be able to link these two virtual machines together with a peered connection between them. So what you want to do is make sure that these actually have not the same address spaces on either side, but have different address spaces on either side. So things like 172.16.0.0 slash um, 16 or some other range that you've actually got in the correct RFC standard. The next thing to remember is not to use the entire address space inside a subnet. So for example, inside VNet1, you will need to create subnets. It would be very irresponsible of you to create a subnet and give the range of IP addresses in this subnet the exact am same amount of addresses that you've actually got available to you. So 10 slash 16. You're not over committing, this would work, but it does not give you room for scope because you would not be able to create multiple other subnets off that or you'd have to completely redesign your entire networking stack uh, to be able to add more subnets inside here. So make sure you've got enough IP addresses, but when you do create subnets, make sure that you keep it scoped accordingly. So you might want to create a subnet like this 10.10.10.0 slash 24 so that we're using a smaller amount of IP addresses inside there. If you are unsure of what the slash 16s and slash 24s are, this is CIDR notation and you should go check out my hour long video on the basic networking that you really need to know for cloud compute because if you're struggling with CIDR notation like this, if you're struggling with subnetting, it's probably something that you need before you start actually deploying things into your Azure environment to get that kind of base knowledge in. One other thing that Microsoft kind of recommend is don't use lots of VNets. What they want you to do is use very small amounts of VNets and lots of subnets inside those VNets. So make sure you've got enough address space to work with and create lots of subnets rather than create lots of VNets. It helps to kind of keep things a little simpler as well. All right. 
So I hope you enjoyed that kind of quick overview here into some of the networking components of the virtual machines in Azure. And I hope this helps you out. Join me next time for more information about Azure and more tutorials about PowerShell as well. And you know the routine, hashtag like and subscribe. And I hope you enjoyed this video and will join me next time. Goodbye.